Good morning everyone, welcome to India Goes Outwards. Uh, this is a special panel on India and over the last 20 years what we've seen with India is a rising nation in the, in the region affecting key decision making in the region in terms of political security as well as economics. Um, it is the largest democracy in the world and India is increasingly becoming a major power, power in the Asia Pacific region as well. 2007 marked the 60th anniversary of Indian independence and India's rise and what it means to the world has now become a catalyst for many people studying the region and many people have actually just discovered that India has become this significant player in security as well as global economics. It's not just an Asian giant but it's also a player when it comes to the business world as well. We're seeing increasingly many Indian firms go outwards and becoming multinational corporations, the likes of Tata, Infosys, Wipro and many other companies. Indeed, it is now envisioning what Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru said, India is certainly awakening. India faces enormous opportunities when it comes to business as well as when it comes to security policy framework in the region, but it also faces enormous challenges as well. The recent McKinsey quarterly growth expected, said that India had to invest something like one trillion US dollars into its public infrastructure and would have another 10 mega cities by 2030. This, in, this poses enormous challenges to current Indian administration as well as future ones as well when it comes to economic decision making as well as security framework within the region. When it just, it's not just infrastructure India faces problems with but also reducing the gap between the rich and poor. With the rising middle class there is a challenge to uh, get the rural sector back on track in India and that is an enormous challenge faced by the Indian government today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel today. Uh, they've come uh, from far and they've got many other commitments and we're very grateful they've been here today with us to present their thoughts on this very special topic. Uh, the format today is going to be a little bit different. Professor Jar has to leave early today due to prior commitments. So we have a Q&A session right after his presentation and then we have Dr. Sandy Gordon presenting his topic along with the Q&A after that. I'll just introduce Professor Jar. Professor Jha is currently working on an Australian Research Council and Aussie project on the design of social sa safety nets in India and the RDRC. Uh, he's also worked on a monetary policy and fiscal federalism, federalism issues for India before. In June 2006, he completed a four-year departmental project for the International Development UK and on, on the impact of nutrition on labour markets in rural India. He believes uh, he works on the behaviour of retail prices for the food grains in India, the sustainability of public debt in developing countries and the linkage between macroeconomic stabilisation and banking crisis in semi-open developing countries. Today he's going to be talking about the GFC in India and how India has played a role in the GFC and its effects on the region as well. Our second panellist today is Professor Sandy Gordon. Uh, Professor Sandy Gordon is currently a visiting fellow with the Centre of Excellence in Policing and Security Regnet, the College of Asia Pacific. In 1997, he was appointed the Head of Intelligence in the AFP, a position he held until 2000. He then became the co-chair of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific Transnational Crime Working Group and a member of the National Expert Advisory Committee on Illicit Drugs. Between 2003 and 2005, he lectured on terrorism and transnational crime at the Australian Defence Force Academy, the University of New South Wales. He is the author of a number of books in India, including Business and Politics, The Search for Substance, India's Rise to Power and Security, and Security Building in the Indian Ocean Region. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Jha to present his material on India at the GFC, and if there's any questions at the end, we'll take it after the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and a uh, warm welcome from uh, my side as well to the Asia Pacific Week at the ANU. It is really a, quite a remarkable event uh, for us in the university, where we get to meet uh, young, uh, bright young people from, from not just Australia, but from across the region as well. And we get to discuss ideas and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and possible research. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is um, is in the, the talk itself is entitled, as you see in this uh, slide here, India and the Global Financial Crisis. 
And I want to preface my talk by just giving you an overview of what happened during the global financial crisis and then talk about the context in which India was able to deal with this global financial crisis. Now, um, the global financial crisis essentially had its roots way back in the early part of the previous decade, when after the um, uh, recession in the early part of 2001, 2002, the interest rates uh, by interest rates legislated by central banks in many parts of the world, in developed countries particularly, the US, Europe, England, and so on and so forth, stayed low for very long periods of time. Okay, so the interest rates were lower to fight the recession of the early 2001-2002 period, but after that they forgot to raise the interest rates. So uh, when, when conditions started to improve, and therefore uh, the the uh, uh, there was there was an atmosphere in which loans were easily available and uh, returns were, were particularly low in some areas. So capital was very keen to find out avenues for very sharp rises in profits. So they invented the subprime mortgage issue there. Okay? So they invented, which, which you may have heard of in the United States, where they created very complex bonds uh, which they traded. Uh, some sometimes these bonds didn't even exist. They 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 were a, a figment of the of the creator's imagination, and they they traded in these bonds to, to somehow increase their yields. And the finance for these bonds, the finance financing for these bonds came easily from the easy money policy, and from the fact that there were huge amounts of. Uh, uh, huge amounts of, um, of funds available from China, which was uh, running a huge surplus, uh, still still running a huge surplus vis-à-vis uh, -vis the United States. The United States became a huge net debtor, and China became a huge net net uh, creditor. Of course, apart from China, there were some other countries as well who were who were in this who were involved in this situation. Uh, Japan was one of them as well as some petroleum exporting countries. But China was the predominant player on the credit side, and the United States was the predominant player on the debit side. So the funds were available uh, from, from, from cheap loans as well as from the, um, as well as from the inflow of capital from China. And uh, the opportunities were available in the form of these complex um, instruments. Uh, complex bonds that were created. So uh, the the yields, particularly in in, in bond markets as, as well as in um, equity markets, went up very sharply. There was what is called an asset price bubble, and uh, banks, of course, were uh, the predominant players in, in lending to to. Um, to, to institutions which wanted to invest in the, in the asset price bubble. Nobody realized that there was an asset price bubble building. Not, not nobody, some people did realize, but their voices were not heard uh, and in, the, in the din of, um, uh, of rapture that engulfed all these people where they were making so much money out of bonds that didn't even exist in the first place. So as a consequence of that, uh, when the bubble burst, um, all financial institutions which were exposed to this, essentially financial institutions which had anything to do with lending for purposes of investing in subprime mortgages or other forms of, or other forms of suspect, uh, uh, suspect investment, they, they essentially uh, went bankrupt because they had lent huge amounts of money to institutions and people who did not, who, who, whose, whose, whose enterprise had suddenly collapsed. So they, so they went bankrupt. As a consequence of that, uh, there was a collapse of confidence 
people thought that if you lent if you lent money to somebody, they would they would never pay you back. So so there was a confidence channel as well as well as a financial channel. And as and as credit froze up, and as credit froze up, uh, there was a downturn in economic activity because economic activity depends crucially on credit. So when credit freezes up, uh, the the uh, um, the credit freezes up, the, the lending to the private sector dries up, and if the private sector can't borrow, then it cannot hire people, it cannot run plant and machinery. So there was a real effect, the, the, uh, there was a real effect, the uh, 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 real economy started to shrink, there was a huge recession in major parts of the world, in Europe, in the United States, and so on. Uh, Australia avoided it very narrowly, but uh, Japan, of course, is going through a prolonged recession. And for the first time uh, in, in many, many years, uh, at, at, least, at, least since the great, at least since the Second World War, first time both global output as well as global trade actually shrank. It never happened in more than 60 years. Uh, so this is a very dire situation. And uh, and uh, it's so, and people are well, the, well, the world economy is slowly sort of pulling its way out of it. Uh, if this situation were allowed to continue, there would be a outcome worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. There's no question about like that. Uh, but what what this has uh, left behind is a legacy of huge debt as government intervened very sharply in order to protect markets, in order to protect lending. The governments intervened to stop banks from failing. The government intervened by injecting liquidity into the market. The government intervened by, 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 by tax cuts and so on and so forth. So all governments in the region, all governments, not just in the region, in, in the whole world actually, ran up huge budgetary deficits which lead to large debts with which they are dealing now. So in some ways, the global financial crisis has become a global debt crisis now, and we are not really completely out of the woods. I, I would not say that just because output has registered positive growth in some parts of the world for a few quarters, I mean, that, that doesn't mean that the, the global economy is out of the woods. So, so basically, there were three channels through which the global, through which through which the uh, global financial crisis um, um, uh, went beyond borders of the United States, where it was where it actually occurred, and affected um, other countries uh, like, like, like like much like a much like a virus. The three the three channels were first there was the finance channel, which I've already talked about very briefly. Then there was the confidence channel, about what, which I have also talked about a little briefly, and there was the consequent trade channel, the collapse of trade, uh, and because trade leads to uh, improvement in, 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 in income and employment and so on and so forth. So trade, um, finance, and confidence, these are the three main channels through which these, um, through which the effects of the global financial crisis went beyond uh, the borders of the United States where it originated and engulfed the whole world. Okay, now, um, so let's just keep that in mind when we approach the question of how India performed during the global financial crisis and what are the prospects for India, uh, what are the prospects for India now, okay? Now, the, uh, the Indian economy, let me uh, give you a little introduction to the Indian economy, and I'll talk about the financial crisis and its impact on India um, during the context of, uh, during this process of, of uh, giving you a brief overview of the Indian economy. So the Indian economy in 2010, India's gross domestic product in purchasing power parity terms. This is a technical term. Uh, you, can, you can compare GDP across countries in two ways. One is by the official exchange rate. So 
uh, if, the, if the GDP of one country is, is uh, 100 uh, rupees and the GDP of another country is, is $50, then you, can, then you can use the market exchange rate between rupee and dollars to express uh, the GDP of, of uh, one country in the, in the currency of the other and so on. But that doesn't take into account the fact that there are many non-traded items, I'll explain this term a little bit, non-traded items, which, for which the official exchange rate is a very poor proxy. Uh, so for example, the, 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 the time on your example is of course, um, is, is, uh, is haircuts, okay? You can't trade haircuts, you can't trade taxi rides, so on and so forth. There are huge, huge, huge quantities of goods and services, particularly in economies like India and China and, and some, other, some, other, some other large countries with huge domestic markets, where uh, the official exchange rate with a non-traded sector is very large and the official exchange rate would be a poor proxy for converting the currency of one country into another. So, so, so to get around that, we have something called a purchasing power parity which are just for the fact that there are there's a huge non-traded good sector, and uh, and uh, and so according to that, in 2010, India's GDP was 3.92 trillion U.S. dollars. Okay, so by by this, India is the fourth largest economy in the world after the U.S., China, and Japan. And in a decade, India is expected to become the third largest economy. It's expected to overtake China. Now, this is before the global financial crisis. Between 2001 to 2007-8, India's real GDP growth averaged 7.3% per annum. Okay. Um, growth rates have recently been around 9% and sometimes in excess of 9% except for the period since 2008-9. Okay, so in that year, the GDP growth rate fell to 6.7% in the face of the global financial crisis. So India's GDP did not slow down very much, but it, was, it is still quite a, quite a shock for India to go down from 9% to 6.7% in the course of one year in the, in the face of the global financial crisis. Okay, now um, why did this shock occur, and why did why why was this shock so limited? Let me spend a little bit of time. Uh, let me spend a little bit of time on that. Now I, I, I isolated uh, three uh, channels through which the global financial crisis um, went beyond the borders of the United States and affected other other countries: the trade channel, the finance channel, and the confidence channel. Now in each of these. India is actually uh, reasonably well placed. India's trade to GDP ratio, the extent of exposure of, of trade in, of, of, of India to the world economy in terms of trade in goods and services is, is much lower than other comparable countries like China. Um, India's, uh, the exposure of Indian banks to the kind of uh, capital assets which were involved in the subprime court mortgage crisis, this is very limited. India has some of the best banking in the world in terms of non-performing assets. It is very small non-performing loan sector and it's very, very, very reasonably uh, 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 attached to or, or related to the kind of capital that was involved in the that was involved in the in the transmission of the global financial crisis, uh, and the confidence channel, of course, was there as global credit markets rose up. Lending in India also started to decline. People were simply uh, simply simply uh, reluctant to lend money, and uh, and if the people don't lend money, banks don't lend money then there is a problem of uh, then there is a problem of investment and production and production starts to fall so in in all in all these three areas 
India's exposure was limited but was growing. All right, it's important to understand that. India's trade to GDP ratio, uh, uh, India's trade to GDP ratio was growing. India's exposure to international banking was growing. And Indian investment was going abroad, as was mentioned earlier. And a lot of FDI was coming into India. So th through all these three channels, the, the India's exposure to the global economy was growing, but not big enough to cause a serious damage. So it was a Goldilocks approach to economic policy. Not too open, not too closed. Okay? That's, 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 that, that was the way in which the Indian policymakers approached, approached, uh, approached this. So they, so, they, so they took advantage of the global economy when it was expanding and therefore had greater exposure, but the exposure had not been so great that it would cause a sharp drop in output from 9% to 2% or 3% or even become, even become negative. Okay, <clears throat> now let me add to that some figures that were released just this past March that this uh, India's population is now, uh, there, there, was a, there was a census on the 28th of February, 2011, <coughs> India had a census, and the preliminary results were released uh, a month later, the detailed results are still to come, come through, and uh, the, uh, the India's population is now 1.21 billion people, it's a huge, huge population, and is uh, comparable to that of China. And, it, and between, 99, between 2001, which was the previous census, immediately previous census, and 2011, the growth rate of population has been about 1.7% per annum. Okay? So if you, if, you, if you look at per capita income, so, uh, 9% minus 1.7% per capita growth is about 7.3% per annum. So, in that, so by that reckoning, India's GDP per capita will double every 10 years. Okay, so that's the scale that we're talking about. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a huge uh, economy on the move. And another important point about, and I'll talk a little bit about that a little later on, another important point about the uh, Indian, Indian population is that the median age of the Indian population is less than 25 years. So you have more than 600 million people who are younger than 25 in the, and in the workforce. So these people are just a staggering thing to Telling thing to contemplate. Uh, these people are going to work harder. Uh, they are going to enter the labor force. They are going to work. They are going to save. They are going to pay taxes, and provided much needed support for for um, Indian growth into the future. So in that regard, this is this is uh, this is extremely extremely important. All right, so this is a quick picture of India's growth, uh, GDP growth. So in the first column here, <coughs> uh, you have the average for 2001 to 2007-8, average growth rate by different sectors of the economy, and GDP growth rate was 7.3% in during this period. 2005-06, it jumped to 9.5. 2.67, it accelerated further to 9.7. 9.2, 6.7 in the during the crisis, during the global financial crisis, and 8%. The very next year, it, it improved from 6.7 to 8%, and then 10-11, it has been 8.6% accelerated again, again going towards 9%. And 11-12, this, this is an estimate of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. It is likely to go back to 9%, but recent trends have suggested that it will probably be a little lower than 9%. Not exactly 9, but, but certainly around 8.5%. So it's a very substantial growth performance. All right. Now, 
one, but one important point is, is however, that, that agriculture, which is this thing here, this is something which is terribly important. Agriculture, which is not growing very well, uh, still supports um, a huge section of the Indian population. So India's fundamental economic problem is the problem that India faces, economic problem India faces, that a sector which accounts for only 17 to 18 percent of GDP, that is agriculture, still supports 60 percent of the population. All right. Growth has been fantastic in manufacturing, in services, and so on and so forth, double-digit growth. But in agriculture, growth has been, has been, has been lackluster and, and lagging. Overall growth, though, this is a very interesting picture. Overall growth has shown this kind of, uh, has, has shown this kind of structure. The blue line here is average growth rate percentage per annum. And the, and the red line is the year-to-year -year standard deviation of growth rates. And this is plotted for decades uh, beginning 1960-61. And as you can see, uh, what is happening is that the growth rate is accelerating and becoming more stable. Okay, the growth rate is accelerating year, and it is becoming more stable. It is not fluctuating very much from year to year. That is because the land of agriculture, which, is, which has this problem of being dependent on the monsoons, is becoming, is becoming less and less. All right. <clears throat> so, the, let, me, uh, let me quickly talk about, so basically the message from the global financial crisis for uh, the message about the impact of the global financial crisis on India is that India's exposure to the global economy was limited in terms of trade, finance, and confidence. Therefore, although the Indian economy took a hit, a, quite a substantial hit, it recovered fairly quickly and is now more or less uh, settled onto, onto a growth path of 8 to 9 percent per annum uh, in, for, the foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. All right, so this is, uh, so now we'll talk a little bit, how, how are we doing in terms of time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Yeah, I'll, I, will, I will not take long. Like so I will quickly, so that's the basic message uh, uh, about India and the global financial crisis. I will talk a little bit about contributors to India's high economic growth. Uh, one is, of course, the, uh, the uh, structure of the population that, that I talked about. The population is also getting literacy rates have, have expanded substantially, and particularly for women, they have gone up very substantially since the 2001 census. Um, India's saving and investment. So typically, economists think of output in terms of, uh, of, um, of uh, three components. The care capital, which comes from savings and investment, labor, and technology. Okay, these three factors are are essentially uh, involved in in producing output, in creating output, and so on. So that's the so that's the population um, population aspect. Now if you look at population aspect a little bit more, this this is a very interesting graph from a from a working paper from the uh, from the IMF. So this is a what is called a population pyramid. So here you have population in millions, and this, 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 this side measures females, this is males, and this is age group, all right? So this is zero to four age group. China in 1960 had so many million girls and so many million boys. Similarly, all the way up to 80 plus, and this is for India. Um, in 1960. Okay, now if you contrast the two countries between 1960 and 2000, you will see that the you will see the the importance of this population dividend or the large base of the Indian population pyramid. This is if we think of it as a pyramid. 
China's population structure is, is now, age structure is now, is very different from what it was in 1960. It is, it is more people in, 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 uh, in the age group 40, 44, uh, 30, 34, and so on. Whereas in, in India, it is a real, it's a real pyramid with the largest number of, of persons being in the zero to four age group. So there's a huge population dividend which will con continue to occur for at least another 20 years. So at least until 2030, this is kind of supposed to go on. And every 10 years, as we were saying, India's GDP per capita is doubling. So you can imagine the huge scale that this will bring, not just for the Indian economy, but for the economy of the region as a whole. So that's labor. Then let's look at capital. So India has a very strong increase in, 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 uh, in, in, in savings and investment. The red line, it, uh, the red line is investment, and the blue line is gross domestic savings. So if you look at it, if you look at 2001, 2002, the, the savings rate was, was just about 20%. And now it has jumped up to, uh, it, in, in just in less than uh, seven, eight years, it has increased by more than 10 percentage points of GDP. And this is precisely what's going to happen if you have a large young population, so young people save, whereas, whereas old people are retired and they're just okay. so, uh, so this So this is, so we have this huge amount of capital that is coming through to to uh, to, uh, to to work work on the economy. So labor is expanding, capital is expanding, and uh, uh, I want to finally give you this table. This is from <coughs> a paper by Bosworth and Collins in a Brookings paper volume, where it shows that technology factor productivity in India, particularly in in things like uh, services here, services, which is India's dominant sector, which is, contributes to more than 60% of India's GDP, is really growing very fast at 3.9% per annum, which is a very substantial growth rate of total factor productivity. It is much more, it is, uh, it is not growing very fast. So this is, remains a problem sector, agriculture, the laggard sector here. But in industry, it is slightly better. Uh, overall, the uh, overall the economy is enjoying 2.3 percent, 2.3 percent of total factor productivity growth. So to summarize now, what I've done, I, 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 I stopped the Indian basic here. Now I will just summarize and try to give you some lessons uh, that we we can learn from this uh, from this kind of. Um, uh, kind of analysis. The sum, 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 to summarize, um, uh, the, the, the uh, exposure to the global economy uh, should not be unquestioned and unfettered. Okay, this is what 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 uh, India's uh, growth experience is telling us. Okay, um, the glo global economy is an engine for growth, but it can be an engine for for sharp reduction in confidence and uh, and, uh, and 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 an avenue for uh, transmission of business cycles from or particularly recessions from one country to another. So the so the so the uh, um, so the unquestioning view that the globe that the opening up the of the of opening up of the economy is always a good idea is subject to some caveats. In particular. Whereas it may be, it may be, whereas it may be useful or it may be right to suggest that opening up of the economy to trade in goods and services is a good idea, it is not necessarily a good idea to suggest that opening up the cap, opening up the, the capital account to, to, to flows of, of capital is always a good idea. Okay, so we have to distinguish between distinguish between uh, opening up in terms of goods and services, in, uh, trade in goods and services, and trade in financial assets. Trade in financial assets needs to be thought through much more carefully 
carefully than before. That's, that's one point, one major lesson I think that we can take home from this. A second major lesson, lesson that we can take home from this is that uh, that uh, um, the Indian economy, like some other economies in the region, provided a much needed um, a much needed support. Uh, to the global economy, the regional economy certainly, maybe even to the global economy, at a time of at a time of crisis. Okay, in the global financial crisis, if India had also gone into crisis and registered negative growth, what would have happened in the region? It would have been a, it would have been a much worse recession, a much longer recession, and a much bigger debt problem than than what we than what we have now. And uh, so, uh, if the Indian economy continues to perform according to expectation, as we as we have here, then it will continue to act as as a major support, uh, as a major bulwark of support for uh, for the region in particular, uh, maybe even the global economy, though it's not as large as yet in the global economy to provide support for the world economy as a whole but certainly to the economy of the region and including and particularly including its major trading partners india can provide indian economy indian economic growth can provide much much needed support so i'll stop there and uh, i'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have Thank you, Professor Jha. Uh, the Australian National University hosts the uh, host KR Narayan oration every year. And this year, we were privileged to have the Reserve Bank Governor of India, Dr. Subaru, present on India and the GFC as well. So we encourage you to look yes, on that. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's one hour website, so please that, take a look at that. That's correct. Um, uh, we'll open up to a Q&A session, but in the interest of time, I'll just take a collection of questions, and because Professor Jha has to leave early as well, uh, we'll take a group of questions, and if Professor Jha can briefly answer them, that would be great, so. Great, thanks, Professor Jha. My question is just about inclusive growth, and you highlighted agriculture, and that's the, one of the problems that it's small base, and it's a point to large uh, percentage of the population. What, what's the prospect of inclusive growth? Just, yeah. We'll just take another question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you showed us the population in graphs. I'm just wondering, uh, there is symmetrical on the sides of males and females, but there is a skewed sex ratio in India. And although that's changing from the 1960s, I was just wondering if that has any impact on taking the investment, as well as expenditure. Any more questions? Uh, Greg? Um, three very short questions. <laughs> 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 that um, a huge 60 percent of Indian population is below 25 if you could 50 percent if you could just clarify uh, where they are are they in the in that 500 million that are poor or are they in the middle class where is this uh, below 25 uh, at what income level if you could clarify that number two you mentioned agriculture is the uh, absorb 60% of uh, labor, but also the least productive. Um, I understand labor market reforms can help this. Am I correct on your, your suggestions? And relating to the third question, how will these two lead this inclusive growth? Uh, of, you have a doubling of GDP every 10 years, but where is, where is that? Per, per capita, per 10 years, where is it going? So, if, uh, sorry, if Professor Jock can just briefly answer those. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, now, in terms of inclusive growth, uh, yeah, in terms of inclusive growth, uh, in terms of inclusive growth, here's a graph that I wanted to, that I can show you. So. Uh, this is the uh, economic growth and poverty reduction in select Asian countries, 1995 to 2005. Um, so this is the percentage response of poverty reduction to economic growth in, in various countries. Okay, So the last column here says ratio of annual rate of poverty reduction 
to annual per capita GDP growth rate. And as you can see, um, India doesn't do particularly well on that score. India's rate of poverty reduction is, is smaller than Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, or, or Vietnam that, that, that we have here. Okay, and why is that? Well, not, it's not a great mystery. The, the, the reason for that is that because the, 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 uh, the uh, growth is biased towards manufacturing and, and services, which requires skilled labor rather than unskilled labor. That's not a mystery at all, and that is, that is the reason why, why, why that is happening. Nevertheless, that said, millions and millions of people have been brought above the poverty line in a relatively short period of time. So you must remember that, that when uh, mass poverty was, was, uh, was eliminated in Europe, it took centuries. Uh, in fact, President Obama mentioned that in his address to the Indian Parliament, that you have done in decades what took uh, Europe centuries to do. That was almost, uh, that's almost a, uh, uh, a reproduction of his, of, his, of his statement before the Indian Parliament. So mass poverty has, there have been serious dents made to mass poverty, but there's a long way to go. There is no question about that. There's still a very long way to go, and about a quarter of, of India's population is still um, quite poor. In fact, the golden age of uh, India's poverty reduction was not the current time period, was the golden age of India's poverty reduction was the 1980s. Because growth in the 1980s was concentrated in agriculture, okay, and agriculture, it, it, the rural sector is where the poor mostly live, okay. So, so a revival of agriculture is crucial to making India's poverty reduction record better than what it is. It really needs to improve. There is no question about that. It needs to improve. Now, in terms of the uh, gender bias, which you, were some, which you, you talked about. Couple of things on that. Um, uh, if you look at the, it's a very strange uh, picture. Uh, the gender bias has act, is different for different age groups. For zero to six years, the gender bias has actually deteriorated between 2001 and 2011. There are fewer girls per thousand boys in 2011 than they were in 2001. It's deteriorated, not improved. That's, that's a fact. Nevertheless, the gender, balance, the gender bias in the age group 5 to 14 is very different. It's much more balanced. So there are, there are things happening there which demographers still have to, still have to, uh, still have to think about. And now in terms of uh, the, uh, um, that, that poverty pyramid, I think, um, that uh, the, the, the differences between, uh, the, the, between males and females, uh, male and female children in the age group zero to six are too small to really register in a, in a, in a diagram like that. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. What, what, what? Uh, anything that I have about the, the, the below 25 yeah. uh, is oh, all over. They're all, they're distributed all over. Um, it is uh, all over the place, um, but uh, it, 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 uh, but we know there's some of my own work in this area is that the poor have more children than the rich. That is that is a fact established by the. Uh, in fact, if you take the if you take the richest if you take the richest group in India, say the people who are who are who are more than twice the poverty line uh, of India, the, the uh, population growth rate there has almost soared. There's hardly any population growth rate growth in that. Basically, this, this replacement is taking place. But there's a lot of population growth at the bottom end of the income distribution. Okay. So that's, that's how it is. That's, 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 that's qualified. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Now, just before I start, I need to, to know, have many of you read Hugh White's book on China Power Shift? Anyone? You familiar with that book? 
Okay, so generally you're not familiar with the idea of a concert of powers as a way of governance in Asia? Okay, well I'll, I'll just explain that concept a little bit in that case as we go through. But my basic start point, if you like, in this, and I'll just um, bring that slide on, is that uh, all countries, as they rise to power, uh, have to do so in the first instance within their own immediate region, or what I call neighbourhood. And India is certainly no exception in this. If you think about it, even the great imperial powers like ancient Rome had to first beat the Etruscans, conquer the Italian peninsula, before they could emerge as the power in the Mediterranean world. Similarly with the US, it had to realise its quote, quote, manifest destiny by moving westward across the continent. Then it had to exercise some sort of command in its own hemisphere, which it did through the Monroe Doctrine and so on. You could say the same thing about uh, Imperial Russia and, and all of these powers. And certainly India in this, as it rises to power, is absolutely no exception. However, international relations experts often overlook this fact and they tend to look at emerging powers as simply chess pieces on the international chess board uh, and to, to view the whole thing internationally instead of in terms of neighbourhood, then region, then internationally. So what I'm going to try and do today is to give you a picture of India's rise to power, but to do so specifically in its domestic context and how that domestic context interacts with its immediate region. And then finally to say something about how you put all that together and view what sort of power India might be and how it might fit in with our Asia-Pacific region. Um, now, when it became independent in 1947, India inherited a series of what I would call irrational borders. And the same applies to what was then Pakistan, which consisted, and I'll just find the point again. Um, yeah. Actually, I might, I might do this with the with this. You can all see the cursor there? Yeah. Okay, that's Let's great. Just do the full PowerPoint. Yeah. Which is... Okay, terrific. Uh, if you look at South Asia today, you'll see that the Durand line, which is set up by the British as the border with Afghanistan, actually cuts across the Pashtun area. And that problem is the seat of much of the difficulties we see today in, in the so-called AFPAC area. Similarly, of course, with Kashmir. Kashmir was a princely state at the time of independence. It was ruled by Hindu Maharaja Hari Singh, but 70% of its population was in fact Muslim. And it has been a bone of contention between India and Pakistan ever since. Also, if one looks at the border with China, that was negotiated as the McMahon Line in uh, 1912, I think it was, but it was negotiated between then British India and Tibet. The Chinese were initially at the negotiations, but they left. So the deal was signed with Tibet, and the Chinese subsequently said this is not a deal because it wasn't signed with us and we were the suzerain power at that time. So you have a contested border along here and a war was fought in 62. And the particularly difficult part of the border at the moment is the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh over here, which has an, a population of 1.1 million is claimed by the Chinese. And were that claim to be realized, uh, it would bring the Chinese down below that strategic barrier of the Himalayas. Uh, there are other aspects of this border which are difficult, which I could talk about. I'll be mentioning the border between India and Bangladesh, uh, which is, it has all these little enclaves. It's a patchwork of a border. The, the Indian Northeast is almost cut off by this area here called the Chicken's Neck, 
at the district of Natural Bari, which is where the name the Naturalites come from. And it's strategically an extraordinarily difficult region as a consequence. So uh, this, this has been a very difficult post-colonial settlement. Um, we also had the fact that on independence, all the railways ran the wrong way because of the, the bad blood between India and Pakistan. And you have to keep in mind that what is now Bangladesh was then Pakistan. The great rail route set up by the British to service the manufacturing centres of Calcutta and Bombay uh, actually ran from the jute growing areas predominantly in Bangladesh and many of the cotton growing areas in Pakistan around the Sindh in here down to Bombay and into there. Now those railways were, were sealed uh, at independence and so these manufacturing centres lost their hinterland and the hinterland lost the source of their markets. Uh, and this affect the, affected the economy ever since. SARC, which is the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, set up in 85, also has not progressed either economically or as a security arrangement because of the fractured nature of politics which was inherited from this background. And intra-SARC trade is very low, it's only 5%. And that is extraordinarily low for a region. Uh, if one looks at NAFTA, I think it's somewhere in the region of, it's the North, uh, North American Free Trade Association. It's, it's somewhere up, and, and also the EU is somewhere up around the 60 and 70% mark, much higher. Um, these factors in turn contributed to significant internal problems in India. We've seen, since 1989, a separatist movement in India, in the Kashmiri part of India, sponsored from across the border in Pakistan, sponsored at both the official and the unofficial level. The Pakistani military intelligence has supported groups like Lakshah e Toiba and Jaish Muhammad and other groups such as Huji. Now, particularly LET and JEM have been very active within Kashmir and even today in wider India as we saw in the Bombay attacks in 2008 in October in supporting unrest. Uh, so there is a close connection between many of these internal problems which you find in India and the post-colonial settlement. The situation in the northeast uh, is very much the same in that Many of the, the people in the Northeast are Indo-Tibetan background. They may be Christian or animist in religion. They're, they're quite different than the people in the so-called Hindi heartland of India. And many of those seven states in the Northeast, the so-called Seven Sisters, have been in a state <coughs> off and on of separatist revolt, uh, going right back to just after independence. Uh, Added to this, you've had the fact that India has today 13.5% of its population is Muslim. About 160 million people, an enormous population of Muslims. Now, most of those people are thoroughly integrated into the Indian polity, but, but by and large they've suffered economically since independence for a variety of reasons which I don't have time to go into. And there is also a homegrown movement as well as being supported, the, this violent jihadi terrorism as some call it, is supported from across the border by Pakistani groups like Lakshah e Toiba, but also there is a significant homegrown terrorist movement within India. Uh, groups like the Students Islamic Movement of India and, and others, uh, the Indian Mujahideen. These are homegrown and they've got their own perceived grievances within India. Now one of those grievances comes from the fact that really since the 1980s you've seen the emergence of a more strident... Um, sorry, I, I just missed a, a slide which I just want to show you. Um,
I've disappeared, it doesn't matter where the McMahon line was, but it didn't matter. But this, uh, this form of more overt Hindu politics, which has emerged in the 80s and 90s particularly, but it's actually been going on since the 1920s, uh, this uh, has actually resulted in the so-called Hindu right assuming power in India in the latter part of the 1990s and up until 2004. And of course, they were the ones that uh, detonated what's called Pokhran II, the nuclear explosions. Now, their agenda is, I think, quite well summed up by this really brilliant cartoon which shows a Hindu holy man here talking to a BJP politician here who looks a little bit sleazy, I must say. <laughs> uh, and he's holding a document called the Common Code. And I'll just explain this as I go through. The Common Code, when the British were in India, they had this policy which some people call divide and rule. But they were largely supported by the minority, which were the Muslims, which were about two-fifths of the population at that time. And they allowed the Muslims to keep the the civil law which governed family relations, or at least some of it, which are, are equated to some aspects of Sharia law. And when the British left, that those provisions were continued by the successive democratic governments in India. And this became a bone of contention. As the Hindu right rose, they said, this is not fair. Uh, every other religion is subject to the state common law, the state civil law, why are Muslims selected out? Why do they have their own special law? And what this politician is saying here is once the national debate is through, we move on to a uniform civil god. The national debate is about who is an Indian. And the Hindu right wants those who aren't Hindus to take on the cultural mores of this ancient Hindu civilization even if they might be Muslim or Christian or Sikh or whatever. And this is particularly problematic, not so much for the Sufi Muslims, but more for the, the, the Salafists, the more puritanical Muslims. Uh, so that's what that's about. We move on to a uniform civil God. Unlike the so-called people of the book, Christians, Muslims and Jews, whose law, if you like, is written down in Bibles, Qurans, and so on. Uh, Hinduism has none of that and it's extremely subtle, uh, complex and divided. It's divided between North and South, between all the different traditions and there are literally thousands of avatars or sub-gods if you like. Now that is like herding a bunch of cats. If you want to use that politically it's very very difficult. So part of this agenda of the Hindu right is to create of Hinduism a more unified religion. And the movement around the northern god Ram, who also resonates in the south, which resulted in the destruction of the Mosque at Ayodhya in 1992, the supposed birthplace of the god Ram, is part of this effort. I can't go into the detail because of time. But one of the results of that, of course, was the destruction of the mosque. And also we saw terrible riots in the state of Gujarat in Western India in 2002, in which almost 2,000 Muslims were killed. And that state at that time, and it still is, was governed by the Bharatiya Janta Party, the political expression of the Hindu right. Now, this rising up of the Hindu right and these depredations uh, were part of the response of this homegrown terrorism as we've seen it. Um, I've got these things. I'm sorry, there, there's another cartoon that's missing. Um, but, but it's a cartoon about, uh, again, this, this same BJP politician is talking to a much smaller journalist. Uh, and. And he's saying, uh, the, I, the, the politician is saying the ISI is responsible for all this terrorism in India. And 
The journalist is saying, yes, I, S, I, meaning I is, I is responsible. I is responsible, it's a pun. So the journalist is implying that the BJP po politician is responsible uh, for creating this terrorism in India and that the BJP politician is saying it's all coming from across the border in Pakistan. It's all their fault. And that, of course, had a serious effect on India-Pakistan relationships. The other great problem which India has is the Naxalite movement, which is less connected to these cross-border movements, but is nonetheless very serious. In fact, Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister, said in 2005 it was the most serious of India's internal security problems. It's evident in almost a third of the Indian districts, these coloured areas, the, the red, the purple and the, and, and the yellow. And now what's really significant about it, it's a Maoist movement, is that it happens to fall within India's minerals provinces and great forested areas. And there's a connection here. And that connection is that the tribal populations, and they're heavily represented in these regions, uh, are being alienated from their land. Many of these populations are animist, who have a relationship with the land a little bit like the Australian Aboriginals. And as they're forced off their land, they have become a fertile ground for revolt. And that is, in a sense, the background for the Maoist movements. They're a great challenge for India, not just in a straight security sense, but also because India needs the minerals and the coal and the energy if it's to rise up economically. Um, all this dissonance has contributed to a situation today in South Asia as a whole in which the population contains more poor people than any other region in the world, more even than sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and you'd have to do the maths here to look at per capita incomes, whether it's in PPP or GDP in the standard measurement. But overall, these 1.6 billion people uh, are extremely poor. India still carries approximately 300 million people, or a quarter of its population, living in poverty, depending on who's measuring. Uh, although the latest report of the UN says that poverty will fall to 22% by 2015. It's approximately 26, 25% now. So it is falling, but there's still an awful lot of poor people. This means that India's policy in terms of how it approaches growth, how it approaches its position in the world, is one of what I call growth with balance. It has to offset the acquisition of raw power, if you like, with uh, efforts to alleviate the lots of the poor by transferring wealth, whether it's through universal education, and they've passed a Universal Education Act, health programs, or rural poverty reduction and rural work programs like the massive National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, scheme or NREGS, which is worth approximately $9 billion a day, an awful lot for, uh, a year, an awful lot for India. Um, So the upshot of this is that defence spending in India, which is currently around 2.4% of GDP today, has risen at times to just under 2.9%. But it's actually relatively low. These are data that come from SIPRI in Stockholm. And you sh it shows that in the decade up until 2008, defence spending had been rising in the USA at, at uh, 67%, China 194%, India 64%. Uh, so India is still relatively low in terms of what it's spending on defence if it's measured in relation to GDP. And what's more, in terms of the way the Indian budget works, while defence expenditure has been rising handsomely, we've seen how overall GDP has been growing from Professor Jha's lecture just now. And therefore defence expenditure, which has been pretty constant in terms of GDP, has been rising 
ipso facto, actually it's, it's still constrained in terms of the central government's budget and that it's only 13% of the budget, whereas if we look at the United States today, it's 20% of the central budget. Whereas you get an enormous chunk of this budget, for instance, in the central plan, which goes to development and other aspects of, of lifting up the people. Um, so this is what I call the policy of growth with balance. Um, the problem India faces, however, in all of this is that while it's got these giant schemes, they don't actually work. The food for work, sorry, the, the, the offtake policy which rips up all the grain and that cooking oil and all that and then redistributes to, to the below poverty households, only 40% of that grain and oil actually gets through. These are World Bank studies to those for whom it's intended. Rajiv Gandhi famously said when he, he was Prime Minister that only 5 to 15% of the rupee that's levied at the centre actually gets through to the grassroots because of the problems of governance and corruption. So you've got clinics, you've got classrooms, you don't necessarily have nurses, doctors and teachers who are turning up for work. Uh, you don't have medicines necessarily. And this is an enormous problem. And corruption in India has now hit the political dimension in a big way because it's gone mega. The latest big corruption scandal uh, is the so-called 2G spectrum scandal. And the auditor in India estimates that the central government lost $39 billion US because those spectrum licenses were corruptly awarded. $39 billion US. Now others have lower estimates. The Central Bureau of Investigation estimate is $7 billion. But it's somewhere in between those two figures. Either way, it's a massive amount of money. The Swiss Bankers Association did a recent study and they found that $1.4 billion, sorry, $1.4 trillion of Indian money is in Swiss banks, much of it so-called black money. The next highest amount is Russia. We all know about the Russian mafia. That's approximately 400 billion. The scale of this is absolutely enormous. Now, so the challenge for India is not just to, to levy taxes and get this money, it's actually to, to make it work. They have a range of projects that, that they're engaged in at the moment to make this happen. And I believe some are quite promising. I don't have time to go into that today. I want to now move on to look at some of the regional implications in South Asia of all of this, to bring up this particular slide again. Five minutes? Um, a little bit over there. Or... Right. All right. OK, I've got to put my running shoes on in this. <laughs> I'm going to skip over India and its South Asian region. I've talked about it a bit. I just want to make a couple of points quickly about it. Firstly, the domestic problems throughout the region uh, wash back and forward and trigger off in, inter-regional friction. I've already re referred to what happens between India and Pakistan, but that happens in a whole lot of countries. And also India is a giant amongst, pi amongst pigeons, amongst uh, pygmies in this region. And therefore, according to what we call the Cotillian dictum, Cotillia was a great uh, strategic philosopher in the 4th century BCE. These countries are suspicious of India that surround India, the much smaller ones, and they tend to form alliances with more distant powerful countries that can offset and balance India. The current one, which is active all through South Asia, is China. And China, of course, is India's great competitor. So this is what's going on in the region. Uh, you've got this dissonance, You've got China as a major factor. So India's region is a burden in its rise to power, but in some ways it's also a blessing. If you look at the 
Indian Ocean, India is the only power of potential in that region. Australia is always going to be a middle power. It's the next most powerful power, Australia in military terms. India is the only power of potential, whereas if you look at China, it's offset by the United States, Russia and Japan in its part of the world. I'm assuming that in strategic sense, the Himalayas are a great barrier. So even though India and China share a border, it's very difficult for them to fight a major land-based war. Um, I'm now going to move on to say something about India and the world. Um, India's economy, as it rises in the world, uh, is in many ways favourable to it. Uh, it's an economy that's developed through high-tech services and not labour-intensive manufacturing. It's going to have to, in the future, pick up that labour-intensive manufacturing mantle if it's going to really compete, which means it's got to spend massive amounts on infrastructure. Rommel mentioned even the urbanisation infrastructure, 1.7 trillion. Uh, now, but at the same time, because it's a significant service-based IT, it's got this enormous soft power potential. These are some of the Indian companies which are investing all over the world, much more prominently than Chinese companies. People are suspicious of Chinese companies because many of the big ones are actually state-owned companies. This is very much an economy which hasn't developed its infrastructure, but it's got 100,000 million little entrepreneurs working away. You see one of them here. I don't know if you can see the detail of this. Um, but when it comes to India and the great powers, uh, you see a different situation. These are the border areas. This is Arunachal Pradesh here, which I've already mentioned, and Aksai Chin. And these border areas are contested. You've got China still shifting away and drawing away from India. Uh, these are the data which uh, come from the e Economic Economist Intelligence Unit. Unfortunately, the grey line, which is India, is very hard to see here. Uh, this is GDP at market exchange, more, more important is PPP. Um, so this is China, it's rising rapidly, this is the US and this is India. So even though India's done extraordinarily well, China's doing still better. Uh, there's the population tree. <coughs> India will start to pick up with China, no doubt, because of the problem of the lack of young people. But to do that, India's got to realise its labour-intensive manufacturing potential. And it won't happen soon, because China can substitute capital for labour. It's built up this enormous, just as Japan did, enormous amount of capital. Uh, so at the same time, India is very suspicious of China. Uh, India considers that China is developing a string of pearls of bases. This is not true. This is how India sees it. Uh, to protect its energy sea lines of communication. Now China, ironically, sees the need to do this because it sees India as a great big aircraft carrier that might work in consort, in consort with the US and India and the US are moving progressively closer together to interdict those vital energy sea lines of communication. So it's trying to build influence right through this region and we have a classic security dilemma that as China tries to protect its its domain, India sees it as a threat. India then ramps up its alliance with the US. It ramps up its military capability. It's gone nuclear, as you all know. It's trying to put those nuclear weapons on submarines and so on and so forth. Now, I've done, because I ran out of time, scant justice to this, but my essential message is, and that's why I asked about Hugh White. Hugh White says that one way of handling this security dilemma in Asia is to develop a concert of powers in which the great powers, China, the US, Japan, Russia and India, will work as a rich man's club. 
They'll sit down and solve the problems of the region together, an informal relationship. My argument would be to this is that it doesn't account for the way India has to rise to power, first of all through this very difficult region, and then in terms of its relationship with China, a China that is actually pulling away. So there's an equal chance. I'm not saying that what Hugh White is advocating won't happen, but there is an equal chance that this relationship between India and the US, India and Japan, India and Australia, India and other like-minded powers in the region may not become what I call an incipient balance of power. Uh, so that while I don't think we'll see a balance of power and containment as we saw in the Cold War, because no one can afford to have that anymore because we need trade, it'll be what I would call an incipient balance of power that is there waiting in the wings and is developing if China's rise is not considered to be a peaceful rise. Thanks, Ron.